Good morning, happy Friday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Okay, it's the end of the week, had a great week. I got some messages from some of the extended family this morning, so I'm in a really good mood about that. Um, I'm gonna pull a Q&A off of IFAST University that, that came through that I thought would be very, very useful for many people because um, it covers some of the basic things that we talk about, but it also throws a little element of complexity um, at the end. So this comes from Dr. Sandy, and she's got a series of, of questions here, and we'll kind of knock them out um, as we go here. So Dr. Sandy says, in the perfect human being, abbreviated PHB, perfect human being. I'm going to steal that one, Sandy. Thank you. Uh, standing in the same spot and breathing is counternutation and nutation of the sacrum simultaneous and synchronized with the movement of the sternum to maintain a fixed spatial relationship or are the movements of the sacrum independent and adapting to the consequences of, of thoracic movement? So one, we're not going to be able to separate any of this, this stuff, but if we're talking about the PHB, the perfect human being, um, standing and, and breathing. Uh, we have a, an expansion that occurs during inhalation and we have a compression that would occur during exhalation. And so if we're looking at the movement of the sacrum as we breathe in, we're going to get a counter nutation of the sacrum and, and the axial skeleton itself is going to, to expand throughout. I would, I would prefer that we talked about analogous structures when we're talking about um, the, the synchronization of movement. So for instance, if we're talking about the sacral movement, moving in the counter nutation, we're gonna talk about the dorsal rostral area expanding as well because they are analogous um, as far as their, their behaviors are concerned. Um, and then obviously as we exhale, we get nutation of the sacrum, we're gonna get compression of dorsal rostral. Now, that doesn't mean that the sternum's not moving through its pump handle action, so to speak, as we, as we breathe in and out, which typically under normal circumstances would be synchronized with the expansion and compression. So technically speaking, yes, we, we would have this synchronized movement of the, of the sternum and the sacrum. But again, I want to draw your attention to analogous structures because that helps us when we're trying to model movement um, associated with compression and expansion. Looking at these analogous structures is a little bit more effective for us in determining the, the reasons as to why we may see certain presentations, certain strategies that are influencing movement. So again, let me just direct your attention to that. Uh, secondly, similarly, this is also from Dr. Sandy, in the PHB, oh, love that, in the PHB, standing still and inhaling is the descent of the pelvic diaphragm simultaneous and synchronized with the descent of the thoracic diaphragm to maintain a fixed spatial relationship or is the depth of descent in response to changing gut pressures? So I, I think you're, you're sort of making a reference to, to the same thing here. So if we think about, we take a breath in, the, the thoracic diaphragm has to descend and we have a fixed compartment of, of fluid in the gut. Um, it's gotta go somewhere. Um, and so in a, again, in a perfect world, we would see this synchronous movement of, of the, the thoracic diaphragm descending and then the pelvic outlet um, also descending at the same time, again, because we have this fixed volume of incompressible fluid. Now there's certain, obviously, compensatory strategies that could be taking place that would influence that, but we're not talking about compensatory strategies at this point. Um, Sandy goes on to say that if we held this same PHB upside down, but the ankles are placed on all fours, would the pelvic diaphragm descend the same level as when standing during inhalation or adapt accordingly to the changes in gut pressure? And so, so this is going to be an adapt accordingly question. So this is exactly why we use different body positions and orientations to gravity as, as we're trying to influence the, the motor output strategies that we would see or to reacquire ranges of motion because what we can do by orienting the body, we can change the shape of the axial skeleton very easily. We can alter the influence of gravity that, that makes reacquiring movement um, much more easy um, because we can reduce the, the demands on, on the motor output and reduce these compensatory strategies that actually interfere uh, with, with movement. So this would be one of those things why when we talk about inversion, for instance, where we put a, a narrow and a prone inversion, we will put a wide and a supine inversion because of the, of the shape of the, the descending thoracic diaphragm and then the resultant uh, uh, pelvic outlet shape. 
and so we have a better shot at influencing those in, in those situations, um, we would take a wide and we would put them on their side because just laying, laying someone on their side increases the anterior posterior expansion capability. So uh, for instance, if you're in the gym and you're trying to decide, oh, do I need to do a prone plank or, or a, like a side plank, um, you might make the decision to put your narrows in prone and your wides in, in a side plank simply because you get a much better shape change if your goal, if your goal is to restore, restore movement. Um, that's to alleviate compensatory strategies. Now, having said all of that, there will come a point in time where everybody will use a compensatory strategy. So we see this in high levels of performance. So under situations of high force or high speed, eventually you're going to hit a threshold where you're going to have to use a compensatory strategy where we're gonna reduce the relative motion between movement segments, where we're gonna use superficial strategies because to move quickly, forcefully, um, we're gonna have to use this external musculature. That's why it's there. Now the question becomes is, do I wanna carry around those, those movement strategies all the time? And that tends to be why people come to see people like me and where they have a, a movement related problem that they can't solve or they might have some pain related issues associated with using these compensatory strategies in, in a lower intensity context. So I hope that answers your questions. Um, if it doesn't, please ask another question at askbillhartman at gmail.com or throw a question up here on, on the Instagram or YouTube if you're wherever you're watching this. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. And I will see you next week.